Aloha and welcome to this week's edition of Business in Hawaii. I'm Daylan Yanagira and we're broadcasting live from the Think Tech Studios in downtown Honolulu. If you would like to tune in live, we are at www.thinktechhawaii.com and you can sign up and get on our mailing list there as well. The theme of Business in Hawaii is to highlight local businesses by local people and our guests share with us how they were able to build successes in a, challenge, in a sometimes challenging environment. With us in the Think Tech studios today is a familiar face. Ray Tsuchiyama is a real estate advisor and senior project manager with Cushman and, w and Wakefield Cheney Brooks. Um, Ray is also a consultant and is an amazing resource for us. Um, Ray, thank you for joining me today. I have to tell you, um, if I ever want to know anything about anything, literally, I would reach out to you. Your wealth of knowledge spans uh, oceans, literally. <laughs> your, your knowledge of international relations, just amazing. So I don't know if our audience ever had a chance to hear about your background, where, where you came from, where, where it all started. Well, uh, it, I always see myself as a boy from Kalihipalama. That's where I grew up, uh, although I was born in Japan. And a lot of the things that I really see my success or interactions with people from uh, all walks of life or in all regions like Asia Pacific or beyond uh, comes from my education and interacting with people in Kalihipalama, which they taught me uh, respect for each other and uh, also uh, really diversity and uh, to kind of listen to what their backgrounds are all about. You just can't make assumptions about anybody that you first meet. And that has carried me through the years. Amazing. So I know that you've been at MIT. You've been, you've been with some of the largest corporations and organizations um, across the United States. So t tell us about your, your background. Yes, uh, well, um, I, I worked in, uh, in, in computers, the first off, uh, my real job was back in Massachusetts during the, uh, really the heyday of uh, mini computers and a, a company that nobody talks about now, which is digital equipment, uh, DEC. And I worked in their uh, headquarters in Maynard, Massachusetts. It was an old woolen mill from the Civil War where they developed uh, mini computers, the super mini computers. And then I returned to Hawaii uh, in the early 80s and I was in commercial and industrial real estate with three firms and I can, talk more in depth later about the lessons or insights. Uh, number one, Castle & Cook Properties, old big five companies still around and doing well. Uh, Manor & Finland, which morphed into uh, Colliers International, still the, one of the top three commercial industrial firms in Hawaii in brokerage, investment, and property management. And the third, Mitsui Real Estate. Uh, and they used to own, um, of course, uh, they still own the Halikalani Hotel and also what is now the Topa Towers, uh, which used to be called the Amphac Towers, and, and many other buildings throughout the US and, and Hawaii. And I had an experience um, managing and, and kind of marketing there. And then I went to Japan for 20 years, where I worked for MIT and in the tech area, uh, AOL, um, analog devices and chips, uh, semiconductors, and my last uh, role was senior consultant to Google uh, before the earthquake, and that brought me back to Hawaii uh, after 2011. Wow, just just amazing. <laughs> I mean, uh, somebody with a resume like that is definitely <laughs> a force to be reckoned with. Um, but what I'm really happy about is that we're here today to talk about um, maybe not a new endeavor for you, definitely not a new endeavor for you, but almost a rebirth. Right. into real estate for you. So I, I do know that you got your real estate license That's correct. recently, again. Yeah, in November of right. 2018. So why'd you do that? Well, I got it first in 1984, thereabouts. <clears throat> a different time, a different uh, Hawaii uh, at that point. And then as you know, I left for Japan for 20 years and didn't really use it. And now I'm back, and after several years back in Hawaii, I thought, oh, this is a thing to, for me to reinvent myself, or you can really teach an old dog new tricks or to relearn, and I entered a course, like everybody else, uh, last November, INET Realty. And uh, the first one I took with John Stapleton, who unfortunately passed away, uh, that was in the 80s. And um, now with uh, Cushman and Wakefield, Cheney Brooks. And Cheney Brooks is a, um, you know, a, a name that goes back to the 70s and, and really has a, a great history in commercial 
and industrial real estate. So I'm back where I kind of was in the 80s in Hawaii, uh, but it's a different place. And the 2019, I feel, is going to be a very exciting year. Fantastic. I want to hear about how things um, were when you entered the market. But before we go there, I have to ask you, so you took the exam in right. the 80s and you took it now right. um, in 2018. Right. Um, was it different? <laughs> Not really. Um, I think, um, interestingly, in the 80s, what was different then is still an issue today, which is about agency. And during the 60s and 70s, there were a lot of incidents where, um, unfortunately, some bad apples uh, it just got together and kind of worked out deals without really uh, being responsible for fiduciary res uh, responsibility to their seller or the buyer. And that had to be very cleaned up uh, during the 80s. And that uh, began a whole training in, in standards about agency. Who do you represent? Mm. And that is still around. That is still a big issue in 2018-19. Uh, you can be even a dual agent, but you have to be very careful. You know, how, how do you uh, respond to an offer? How do you, you know, uh, 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 communicate information to each other? It is still an issue. Now, otherwise, um, land, um, you know, the history for the great Mahele, a leasehold versus fee simple, have not changed at all. Well, that's good to know. That's good to know that um, the knowledge that you had initially just kind of carried forward, just maybe morphed a, a little bit into um, some newer issues. So tell me, what was the real estate market like back in the 80s when you did it the first time? Yeah, well, in the early 80s, um, America was uh, really ravaged by what we don't see t uh, today, which is called stagflation. The end of the Carter years and the beginning of the Reagan years. Uh, um, was a time of uh, economic downturn. Uh, you could have a stagnated economy, which means things are not moving. And then you have high inflation at the same time. Uh, 1980 was a uh, year of 13.5% inflation. There were interest rates going up to 18%. Uh, housing development stopped uh, for many, many uh, developers. And it was a very different time. And it was just before 84, 85, which will be the tsunami of Japanese investment. Mm -hmm. So that five years was like a uh, in-between time from the 70s and then comes the foreign investment boom. Wow. OK, so the other thing is you have a memory like, I, don't, I know they say elephants, <laughs> but. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you remember the most intricate details of so many things, just amazing. Um, so the real estate market now, um, signs in Hawaii real estate indicators from back then to... to well, let's look at uh, December of 2018, which kind of gives a, maybe a portent of what's happening. And it's interesting, uh, there's a, a press release from uh, the Honolulu Board of Realtors that said in December 2017, there were 361 house sales. One year later, there's only 259, a 30% drop. Uh, but we, uh, what does that mean? Uh, are people waiting uh, to you know, put in an offer? Uh, uh, maybe they're waiting for a decline in prices. Uh, we may see an explosion in Q1 in the spring for, uh, for buyers to step up, or they feel that prices will go down uh, a little bit more. So I, I, I don't know what that portends, but uh, uh, there are some realtors who do um, uh, put their um, uh, properties on, a, on the MLS, the multiple listing services. Mm -hmm. If it gets too, too long, they withdraw it, and then they come back again. So it kind of, uh, it, it is, uh, there's a, um, so you don't really see how long some uh, properties are, uh, are in the market, and, and maybe a much longer time than some people think, especially in the higher, higher uh, uh, property levels. So what are the macro trends? affecting Hawaii, Hawaii's real estate industry then and now? Yeah, well, uh, well one is interest rates, which is um, the Fed is thinking about raising to 2.5. <laughs> and then if you add another 1%, that's the mortgage rates. I mean, 3.5, 3.8, whatever. And that is so low still, uh, back to 16, 17, 18%. That's number one. Number two, unemployment, very low, very low. Mm -hmm. Hawaii may have one of the lowest unemployment uh, rates in the entire nation. Uh, the other area is, of course, um, uh, in, in um, 
uh, in, in currencies. I predict that in Q1, the Japanese yen will increase in value for several reasons vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US dollar. Mm -hmm. And it, it's going to be uh, that there's volatility in the Nikkei stock market. Uh, as people are moving to uh, a safe haven, uh, the yen. Uh, the April 1st abdication of the emperor will see a, a lot of consumer demand coming up. There's going to be a lot more uh, visitors to Hawaii. Uh, so that's an area uh, I think uh, some realtors are looking at. Uh, and the stronger yen means more buying mm -hmm. power. And that's a macro uh, trend. Right. The Chinese uh, renminbi, I pr uh, predict, will uh, decrease in value to the, the U.S. dollar. It used to be, when I was going to China in the early 2000s, it used to be 8.4, 8.5 to a dollar. It went all the way down to 6. Now it's climbing back to 6.5. It may go to 7. And so there's a volatility in the trade issues between the U.S. and China. And there's a slowdown in the Chinese economy right now. So one area that people may look at is the um, uh, number of visitors during Chinese New Year's going outside of China. Mm -hmm. If they're going to closer places like Korea, Japan, or, or Southeast Asia, or Australia, that means they don't have that much money. They want to keep their money. If they're going to Vegas, to Vancouver, to London, and, and buying a lot of consumer goods, then you see, well, the economy seems to be still very strong. So what about those micro trends um, in Hawaii real estate, especially where some of the major players are concerned? Well, uh, I think we're in a kind of um, uh, curious in-between period. And some older, more established firms, uh, brands like Kahala Associates, uh, Jane Worrell, are gone. Uh, you have uh, teams now. Uh, for, for example, Myron Kiru. He has a team at Better Homes and Gardens. There's the Ihara team at Keller Williams. There's uh, preview agents, the top you know, 10 uh, preview agents who do the uh, top uh, uh, properties at Coa Banker. They're, uh, they're still there increasing their share. And so there's more done by less, fewer people. Mm -hmm. But when I say like Better Homes and Gardens or Keller Williams, they didn't exist five years ago. They're, they're new entrants. So, uh, you know, if you go back 20 years, Herbert Horitas and so forth, uh, more in the locations, uh, they will be much more uh, in, the, um, in the market. So there's, there's some changes here in residential. Yeah. And uh, like Pacific Elite came in, and they're now statewide. For Coldwell Banker, there's still a Oahu office and a Maui office. So um, a statewide uh, you know, marketing uh, effort is qu still uh, not, that, uh, not that rare. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a new innovation. Hmm. Um, we do need to take a quick break, but let's um, take that break. And when we come back, let's talk about some trends. I want to okay. pick your brain about some trends. And then um, talk about your new adventure. I, <laughs> I'd like to know more about that. <laughs> so we are going to take that break. Uh, we will see you back here shortly. This is Business in Hawaii. Welcome back. This is Business in Hawaii. Today we have Ray Tsuchiyama, not an unfamiliar face um, here at ThinkTech. Um, but when we left Ray, we were talking about um, how the trends have changed from back in the 80s to now and the changes that have occurred and the international market, the strengthening of the, the yen and Perhaps we're, we're waiting to see what's going to happen um, with China and how that's, that's going to fold into the mix. But we were talking about um, pricing, 
And you had mentioned to me on our break that um, supply inventory is... Right. And, and this is, uh, has been pointed out by Paul Brubaker, the uh, great economist, local economist. And uh, he went into back in the day, in the 70s and 80s, and there were years when there were like 10,000 to 14,000 housing units entering the market. We don't have that anymore. So, so that supply and inventory is very crucial to, um, uh, to the real estate market in terms of uh, pricing and so forth. And, but, and what is relevant even back then is still an issue today, which is uh, the permitting and zoning process, which affects uh, the price of uh, the finished uh, house or right. uh, apartment building and so forth. And that adds a lot to, um, uh, to uh, higher prices than the mainland. Uh, in, on mainland, many places, I'm not saying we should be like Houston, which uh, transforms ag land to you know a BMX uh, mixed use in like nine months, <laughs> but there there has to be some way of increasing inventory. We have to build. Um, so, gonna go far, and we're gonna ask okay. you to make some predictions. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So there's some micro trends that affect, uh, I think, uh, the real estate market. And one is that people, especially young people, are leaving the state. And that is not a good sign because that means that the uh, uh, demographic that has a great job and pays taxes are leaving. And those taxes pay for the roads and, and uh, government and all kinds of services and so forth. So that's, that's one thing uh, that, that is uh, uh, very, very rare for a state to lose people. That's number one. Number two, there's a flip side. There's, of course, the seniors uh, who still remain in Hawaii. And they are downsizing. They're moving to lar from larger homes into condominiums. And, and so, uh, but we still lack hospices, a lot more uh, senior uh, facilities. That's another one. And, um, and there's another third one, which is the aging infrastructure. A lot of the homes are old. When you think about you, a lot of plantation homes are built before, uh, before the war or just after the war. Even uh, when you look at uh, a great place like the Gold Coast, uh, a lot of those co-ops were built around statehood again. So uh, some, some of the condo uh, or co-op owners are being hit by assessments that may be as high as fifty to $100,000 per unit. The, the pipes are corroding, uh, the sewage systems, and all kinds of uh, infrastructure. So uh, that's uh, 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 a third micro point. The final micro point is I'm still an optimist. I'm still an optimist <laughs> that somehow we can uh, get a new tack with mass transit. That the last uh, four or five stations from Ala Moana to Waikiki could be a great um, public-private partnership. And again, um, the reason you have mass transit is that you are responding to uh, population growth. Mm -hmm. You don't want more cars, so you have mass transit to take care of people who, are, who otherwise would be on the road. If you have a declining population, that uh, takes away the reason for mass transit, which is very ironic. Uh, now uh, we're in 2019. However, uh, we, don't see, we should not be seen as TOD or transportation-oriented development. I'm taking words from Paul Brubaker, but we should see it as development-oriented transportation. How can we enhance the inner core of Honolulu so that people can live and, and go to their workplaces along the stations mm -hmm. of the line and not use a car? Does, does the industry ever consider what they can do to change some of those micro trends? You, you were mentioning um, young people leaving, um, you know, the old people, the older folks not, you know, um, having facilities. Does the industry ever get proactive about what they can do to change a trend like that? I think people are aware of that. And I think people uh, are in the Chamber of Commerce is, and, and they're really aware of these issues and challenges. I mean, the number one issue should be um, public education <laughs> uh, for the state. And of course, how to you know, diversify the economy so that uh, people who want to be in certain areas, uh, you know, tech sector or finance can remain in Hawaii. This is a larger issue than purely real estate. And uh, why should the real estate sector uh, be the vanguard of economic diversification? Maybe they could be, but again, that should be a leadership of the state and, and um, chambers of commerce and so forth. But, but that 
to me is an indication that we are not addressing that very economic disconnect uh, in, in our society. I, you know, I believe that it's, it's really a collective effort of all of our communities coming together. Governor Ige with his uh, campaign for 20 by 25, and then of course the promotion of STEM education, robotics, those are all great efforts to try, trying to address perhaps um, bringing a different type of education, educated people um, to, to Hawaii. Now, you know, it's very interesting you say that because um, uh, we, in a society, you want to change human behavior for the good, right? When you look at real estate, there are over 80,000 probably who have passed the test. So they paid $450 to $500, stayed in a, in a uh, classroom, and many of them are inactive. They're not in uh, active uh, brokerage. And then you say, but they took that risk because they saw that they could further themselves and, and, uh, uh, and, and develop uh, better earning potential. Okay? Now, you could say the same. Why aren't there 80,000 software coders? <laughs> or people who are expert in uh, Asia-Pacific uh, uh, trade or exports, uh, many areas. Uh, and, and that, but they're not doing that. When I was in Vietnam, in Hanoi, at 10 o'clock at night, I looked for my taxi, and there was a fuzzy glow from a building. And there were all these people studying coding at 10 o'clock at night. You see, how can you provide incentives so that you can uh, mold a society where you want to go? I'm not saying that people should not become realtors, or, but they're taking that risk and, and, and they see the incentive to become a real estate broker because that would add more salary, more compensation or, or whatever in their lives. But even if they became a coder, does that mean they have a great job? You know, I don't see the Googles and Facebooks and Amazons in Hawaii. They're, they're not here. And the other thing is maybe we should focus on developing a you know, uh, computer science department at UH or other places that would be in the top 25 or 50. That is a great goal in five years. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other thing is if we want to develop real estate apps and be the leader in real estate for the globe, why not have a center of real estate and synergize it with the computer science department? So I, I hear your passion. I hear your passion for real estate. I hear your passion for technology. So tell me about um, how technology has impacted other industries. I know that you, you keep up with the, the, the biggest and the greatest and, and all of the happenings. But in 2019, how does technology affect the real estate Industry. You know, this is, this is uh, every January for the past several years, uh, people make uh, predictions or pronosticate, you know, uh, into the future. And it, it, this is a very complicated issue because there's, uh, for example, how do you uh, transfer the, the technology for Pokemon Go, for, you know, for AR, augmented reality, which is, that's, that's an example of AR, or virtual reality to, you know, uh, showing um, uh, Kahala homes or Kaimuki homes or uh, Maui homes or whatever. Uh, how, how to use a smartphone or tablets to show people, or how, and there are companies out there that are trying to exclude realtors. I mean, uh, many realtors uh, feel that uh, real estate is a very um, uh, local, local uh, profession. I mean, uh, there's a person who, um, who are experts in Manoa, for example, <laughs> only, uh, or uh, on West Maui, uh, or something like that. So. I, I, how do we do it? This is a very difficult question. I think what we have to, uh, the other question we have to ask first is, what is the uptake for technology among people in general? Mm -hmm. Do you see people using smartphones more or laptops or tablets? I don't think so. I don't think we are at a level as San Francisco or New York or other places. I think we have to get people up a level before we start talking about apps and so forth that will be uh, leveraged uh, by the general public for real estate. So how do we do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, for all companies, uh, and especially, uh, there should be uh, certain uh, uh, ways of doing work. Uh, one of the th but you see, it's not just technology alone. When I worked for MIT, one of the most uh, complex issues during the 90s was why did technology go into companies but productivity didn't increase? Very interesting question. Right. And they found out later that unless you change management, 
uh, uh, the uh, you know uh, levels of management, how people report to each other. Uh, remember, millennials are quite different animals. They're, they they do things, and just because you have technology doesn't mean that everybody will use it or leverage it to become productive. So I think that is the first key. How how do you change companies to become 21st century innovative companies? and also see that they can build global platforms. Remember, we're in a market of 1.2, 1.4 million people. What if uh, people here could uh, develop apps to get 10 cents from every mobile smartphone user in China? We're talking real money. <laughs> right. We're talking real money, but you have to do it in Chinese language. How do you work for China Mobile? How do you work for iPhones and Android uh, uh, platforms? There's a lot of things uh, to get there. But again, I think we have a lot of uh, groups like Chinese language experts, mobile software, tourism, all kinds of real estate, but they're not working together. Mm. We are in a siloed society. It's very unfortunate. Which is interesting given our culture you know, of bringing people together, of Ohana, and it's, it's really amazing. I knew this was gonna happen, that, um, <laughs> that we have so much to, to ask you and so much to glean from you, but unfortunately we are out of time. I am so thankful that you joined us and gave us an, an outlook, the 2019 outlook, and I know that we'll come and tap you again to um, get the, the update on how we're doing, um, but thank you so much for joining us. Really thank you, thank that. you. Uh, we are out of time. I wanted to thank the wonderful production staff here at the studio. If you would like to be a guest on our show, please email your information to shows at thinktechhawaii.com. Business in Hawaii airs every Thursday at 2 o'clock, and we look forward to seeing you here next week.